It was called mankind's greatest adventure, and this was to be its stepping off point, pad 34 at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This was where the human race would take its first steps to leave the Earth behind and venture to another world, something people could only dream about before. The United States had been in the manned space business for only a few years, first with the one-man Mercury back in 1961, which proved it knew how to get into space. The United States launched its second manned orbital space flight at 0745 a.m. Eastern Standard Time here today. This is Mercury Control. Right now, uh, 6 is about 10 feet above the left of 7. Then the country progressed to the two-man Gemini program, which proved that American astronauts knew how to rendezvous and work in space. Roger, Jim. Now the National Aeronautics and Space Administration had to prove it could pull off the technological master feat of all time, actually go to the moon. The program that was going to do that was the three-man Apollo. The prototype of the lunar spacecraft was this one, which would go down in history as Apollo 1. It was being put atop its rocket booster only five years after President John F. Kennedy took the country by surprise in a historic speech before Congress. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. Well, I recall listening to the speech in my car in Florida at Cape Canaveral. And as I heard him make the statement, it was May 25th, 1961, of committing to get a crew to the moon and return him safely to Earth, I turned to the gentleman sitting in the front seat with me and I said, you know, we got our work cut out for us. Referring to Kennedy's schedule, to reach the moon before the end of the 60s, uh, created back in 1961, created uh, a sense of excitement, but there was also a sense of, you know, we needed to, it was a great goal, so let's see what we can do about uh, accomplishing it in that time frame. You know, we, we only had 16 minutes of space flight experience, and it was Al Shepard's several order flight, and the president says, we're gonna go to the moon. You know, and that was, that was a quantum leap way over here and we call it Apollo. The young president had inherited a war. It was called the Cold War and the space race was a pivotal battlefield in that conflict. Few people knew it at the time, but one of his first official acts as president, he had been in office just 90 days, was a memo to Vice President Lyndon Johnson, plaintively, almost desperately, asking if there wasn't some way to beat the Russians at their own game, space exploration. Is there any space program, the young president asks, which promises dramatic results in which we could win? And then 10 words that were to put the whole might and wealth of the United States behind the space program. Are we making the maximum effort, the president wanted to know. Are we achieving necessary results? There was only one place left to beat the Russians. They had already garnered most of the space laurels. They were the first in space with Sputnik back in 1957. Then, just days before the fateful memo, they had put the first human in space, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. If you wanted to upstage the Russians in space, there seemed to be only one way left to do it, get to the moon before they did. People forget the fact that the Apollo program in its purest form was a battle in the Cold War. Uh, we would have never gone to the moon uh, in the time frame that uh, we did had it not been for the Soviet threat and the Soviet competition. So there was a lot of pressure to get it done and get it done right. I would not willingly risk my life simply from the standpoint of, of exploration. That wasn't in me. What motivated me at that point was the Cold War, and I thought the concept of our society remaining free was worth the risk. The men of Apollo were not just astronauts. They were also cold warriors. 
The three astronauts for the first manned Apollo flight were already national heroes. Ten days before the simulated liftoff, they were paraded for their last photo op at Pad 34. Virgil Grissom, 40 years old, known as Gus. He was to be the commander of the first manned Apollo flight. An Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, he was one of the original seven American astronauts. He had flown in both the Mercury and the Gemini programs. He was the old hand. In 1961, he had been the second American to go into space. They almost lost him on recovery when the hatch blew on his Mercury capsule. It flooded with water and sank. The accidental detonation of the explosive bolts on his Mercury hatch would start a chain of events that would become a part of Grissom's destiny. Gus Grissom knew he had a dangerous job. There is some risk. I recognize it, but uh, just try to take as much of that out as we can during the pre-testing to make sure the systems are good. We recognize that there are unknowns and things can happen that, that we haven't planned for. Grissom's second in command was Ed White, 36 years old, the All-American. The son of a general, he, like Grissom, was also an Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. Two years before, he had become the first American to walk in space when he floated out of his Gemini capsule more than 100 miles over the Pacific. He was a national celebrity, thrust into the spotlight by a nation still excited by exploits in space. And the youngest of the group, 31-year-old Roger Chaffee, the rookie. This would be his first space flight. A Navy lieutenant commander, he had dreamed of flying in space since he was a kid. He was the one who had designed the patch for Apollo 1, long before there was any flight to be named, the flight that was never to be. The three Apollo astronauts knew their spacecraft better than they knew their own homes. They had been with it through its construction at the North American Aviation Plant in Downey, California. But there seemed to be bugs in it. Well, there had been a lot of problems with the spacecraft. This was the first, you know, manned vehicle, uh, first specimen of the spacecraft. And, and there, were, there were problems of... Uh, uh, not only designed, but there were problems, uh, of course, with the uh, uh, workmanship and, and so on in the spacecraft. Gus had come to me, and after he'd been with the spacecraft in, in uh, California, and then <clears throat> when he came back to the Cape, saying, you know, there are a lot of things wrong with this spacecraft. It's not as good as the ones which we flew earlier. Uh, the Gemini and uh, the Mercury spacecraft. He said, this, this is something different about this thing. And we would say, of course it's different, Gus. It's a brand new spacecraft. But it's your responsibility to tell us and the engineers what you find specifically wrong. And things will be fixed. We're not going to launch you unless everything is perfect. Rest assured of that. But, but Gus and, and Ed and Roger had lived with that spacecraft, and, and, and they were, you know, they were as knowledgeable as anybody in the whole world about that spacecraft. So I'm sure that they uh, felt it was safe or they wouldn't have gotten in it. The astronauts were more than just knowledgeable about their spacecraft. I mean, we got down and dirty uh, in the development design and the testing of the spacecraft. I mean, we got our hands big time dirty in terms of working with the engineers, working with the, uh, with the test people, uh, uh, knowing the people who were designing and building, putting the user's input. Because, you know, we were all aviators and although we didn't have a lot of knowledge of what it was going to take to go to the moon, we probably had as much as anybody at that point in time and we're learning more each day. By January of 1967, everyone seemed to feel that most of the bugs had been fixed in the first Apollo. As far as our assessment was concerned, as far as our knowledge at the time, that things were done to meet the necessary specification before we proceeded. That was our actions in Florida and usually backed up totally by the designer and the, and the plant producing it. The plant producing it, North American Aviation, the premier aeronautical manufacturer. The man running it, 
Lee Atwood, a recognized aeronautical engineer in the business for almost 40 years at the time. At 91 and long retired, he searches records and writes about Apollo 1, trying to make sure his old company does not go down in history as designing a fatal spacecraft. Things are not on schedule. Things had been changed. There had been uh, redraws of the drawings and many things like that, which is not unusual at that stage and something that's brand new. And the allegation was made that we were wasting money by having too many people employed. Those two things, the schedule and uh, wasted money and effort, were the primary criticisms, and I was doing everything I could to address those things. No one had ever built a moonship before. There was no model to go by. It had so many parts, it seems, that people lost count. Some technicians say it had two million, some say three. Well, at the time, I think it was the most complicated machine that had ever been made. It, we had uh, a, a computer on board that is absolutely elementary by today's standards, and I'm sure that the Apollo pales in comparison to the complexity of the shuttle. But at that point, it was indeed the most uh, uh, complicated machine that, that had ever been used by man. It would truly go where no man had gone before. Once out of Earth orbit, it would have to use a different system of navigation. Earthbound or even Earth orbit celestial navigation would bear no relevance. Some experts say it was the only true spacecraft in the sense that it would not just orbit the Earth, but leave this world and travel out into space to another one. It would take more power than could be imagined. Previous spacecraft traveled at more than 17,000 miles an hour to attain Earth orbit. That would not be good enough for Apollo. The lunar spacecraft eventually would have to shoot away from the Earth at an astounding 24,000 miles an hour to escape Earth's gravity and get to the moon. That speed would be like circling the Earth in just 60 minutes. On an actual flight to the moon, astronauts would climb on top of one of the most powerful devices made by man. The giant booster rocket would be filled with six million pounds of propellants, kerosene, liquid hydrogen, and liquid oxygen, which combined have the equivalent power of six-tenths of an atomic bomb. Everyone knew how dangerous everything was. Everyone knew that a fatal accident could eventually occur. Every astronaut felt someone would get killed. All of us in the early days knew that there would be a time when things did not go right, and things uh, would not go right to the point where you had a tragedy. Uh, there was a prediction, I think, as I recall, that if one flew 100 manned missions, that probably five out of the 100 would result in some kind of catastrophe. So all of us knew in the back of our minds that uh, it would happen someday. We subjugate fear to apprehension. Had a whole bunch of apprehension. But the point is, if you have fear, you're out of control, and you can't afford the luxury of being out of control. The last thing in the world you want to do is to get killed or die, but there is also something that may be more important than your life, and that's the mission. You want to get the mission done. The three astronauts of Apollo 1 knew the risk, but they also knew that they had a mission. Coming up, a disastrous test could mean the end of the space program on Discovery Sunday, next. Watching the Discovery Channel. Explore your world. This program is brought to you in part by Janus No Load Mutual Funds. Life's a trip, and it takes money to get where you're going. That's what mutual funds are for. At Janus, making money means looking for breaks nobody else saw coming, jumping on, and riding them in. No matter what the market's doing, there are great companies to invest in. 
Janice finds them. So you can get there. Janice no load mutual funds. Grand Am design cars for people who get a kick out of driving, complete with a powertrain built to precise aerospace tolerances. And that's kept more Grand Ams tearing along even after 11 years than any car in its class. So buy a Grand Am for a good time, have it around for a good long time. Grand Am, built for kicks, built for keeps, starting around 15-2. Next, it was the first of its kind, and it was supposed to win a war. What happened? Off the coast of the Carolinas, modern technology goes in search of the past. Rebel beneath the waves, as Discovery Sunday continues next on the Discovery Channel. Explore. The plane goes down. The ship is sinking. Find out if you have what it takes to survive. Staying alive on Sidetrack. Premiering Monday at 10 Mountain, 9 Pacific on the Discovery Channel. Explore your world. chances on slopes, but never on the road. Hey, I'm not stupid. Buy or lease a new Volvo and get two season passes to Bear Mountain Ski Resort. Now you've got two more good reasons to drive a Volvo. Volvo, the official car of Bear Mountain Ski Resort. Excuse me, did you know that now Southern Californians get into Disneyland for just $26? Southern Californians get into Disneyland for only $26. It's just too good to pass up. Say, did you know that now Southern Californians get into Disneyland for just $26? Disneyland for only $26? It's just too good to pass up. To tragedy on Pad 34, Apollo Explore. 1. It's January 27th, 1967. The three Apollo astronauts are to take their spacecraft through a simulation of their actual flight scheduled in four weeks. The Saturn 1B rocket booster poised under the Apollo spacecraft is not even fueled. We had uh, classified it as a non-hazardous test. We literally had in our minds with the experience we had had on the uh, Mercury and Gemini and uh, the oxygen itself did not present a hazard, that was a blind spot. They have been breathing pure oxygen through their portable environmental suits for several hours now. This is to purge their bodies of nitrogen, which under extreme pressure changes can start to bubble in the blood causing a potentially fatal condition known by all deep sea divers, the bends. The normal air we breathe is roughly 80% nitrogen and only 20% oxygen. On this fateful day, as in these previously filmed simulations, their command module is also pressurized with 100% oxygen. And we had chosen since the start of the space program to pressurize spacecraft prior to launch with 100% oxygen. It was done uh, primarily uh, to create an environment where no nitrogen could get into the, into the bloodstream of the astronaut. Fortunately, we didn't have any problems with it during the Mercury and the Gemini programs. But no one ever realized the magnitude of what we were doing and how we lucked out, really, in Mercury and Gemini. There was a sense of, well, you know, a ground test. We don't, you don't worry about that. Things can go wrong, and you can get those fixed. And you really don't get totally concerned uh, with problems until 
you know, getting close to launch day. The full rehearsal before you do the launch was essentially what this test was. They also call it plugs out, where they unplug the spacecraft from external power supplies. So it runs on its own power supply. Uh, to do that, you have to close the hatch and you pressurize it with oxygen. Now, the, the way we had done Mercury and Gemini was the same way we did that particular vehicle. We pressurized it with a little bit more oxygen pressure than sea level. Well, sea level pressure is roughly 15 pounds per square inch, so you put a smidgen more, like 15.2 pounds per square inch. Anything in that kind of pure oxygen will burn. You can burn steel wool in there. I'm sure we gave some thought to the fact that that was a pretty high density concentration of oxygen, and that, that put us in somewhat of a dangerous situation, but uh, I don't know that anyone ever thought that we'd really confront any major uh, danger problems or life-threatening problems uh, uh, until we until we lifted off the pad, until we were in space. The Apollo 1 test went through the entire afternoon of January 27th. There were problems all day long. The biggest one seemed to be with communications between the spacecraft and the outside world. Okay, uh, we're ready to pick up, Chuck. About all we can do is give it a try. You copy? No, I didn't read you, Chuck, at all. You want to try the phone? By early evening, pure oxygen had been soaking through everything in the spacecraft for five and a half hours. Jess Owens, an Apollo engineer, had been at Launch Complex 34 all afternoon. When he returned to the stripped out remnants of the booster pedestal after almost 30 years, his memories of that day came flooding back. I was on the eighth level, and I heard one of the crew members say, hey, there's fire in here. And all of us were just stunned. At this time, we're in a blockhouse away from the pad, cannot see the spacecraft directly, but through television cameras can see it. I was looking at the uh, portal uh, there was in the uh, door of the Apollo spacecraft and saw a white, um, I'll call it flash. I heard the pressure vessel relief valve over on the side of the command module let go. And we knew what was happening then, overpressurization. In later tests, investigators would film these reenactments as they tried to reconstruct what had happened. The oxygen-soaked material inside the spacecraft seemed to ignite all at once. In seconds, the temperature soared to 2,500 degrees. Everything was in flames, giving off toxic gases, building up pressure. The accident Gus Grissom had had with his Mercury flight now came back to haunt not only Grissom, but the entire Apollo 1 crew. The hatch had been redesigned to open inwardly. If the pressure increases inside the spacecraft as compared to no pressure outside, the hatch will seal tighter and tighter. That was the calamity, of course, that developed when the fire started. There was no way you could open that hatch again until that pressure was relieved within, within the spacecraft. I started to turn to my left, and the sheet of flame, I mean, this now is all faster than I can, much faster than I can tell it. And a sheet of flame went out to my left, and I didn't see anything else because I had turned in. My, my eyes already had been burned, my clothes, and since my hair, my eyebrows. The spacecraft was rupturing from the intense pressure and heat, blowing out the side near Roger Chaffee's couch. Once there was an opening, the pressure and oxygen escaped. Fresh air flooded in, the fire went out. But it was too late. Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee were dead. They had not burned to death. They were asphyxiated from the gases in the exploding spacecraft. In five minutes, America had lost three heroes, and its space program was in shambles. And of course, that terminated everything we did. It literally brought the whole space program at that point in time to a screeching halt. 
It was the first fatal mistake NASA had ever made. In six years, it had made 16 manned flights without an astronaut getting a bump on the head in a spacecraft. And now, disaster. Well, I didn't believe it. I mean, it was just one of those things. It couldn't possibly have happened. We were doing so well, and even though we knew that the, the spacecraft had some technical difficulties, it, it just, you know, you don't, you don't really worry about losing, losing lives when a spacecraft's sitting on the ground going through a, going through a test. Uh, it was hard to believe right away. I never thought about the fact that an accident like this could happen on the ground. It was the kind of thing that I think went through our minds that if something's going to happen, it's going to happen on the way to the moon, or it's going to happen in space, or it's going to happen when you lift off, or when you, you know, when the parachutes don't open and when you come home. We were sort of prepared for those kind of things, but not prepared for fire in a pad. You can't believe the impact that this fire and these deaths had on the Cape, for instance. People got to drinking too much, taking uppers and downers, and the damn doctors were handing out you know, people so they go to sleep and then they're handing out stuff to wake them up. It was really sick. We just, we just, it was just proven to us that we're not, we're not infallible. I mean, we, we just took a big hit. We just lost three guys and they hadn't even had a chance to get off the pad. So we knew we were vulnerable. We weren't sure what happened. All we knew is there was a catastrophe and these three guys had just been killed. And of course, I, I guess somewhere along the line, we all probably, uh, underneath our, our, our grief and concern, we're wondering, what does this mean for the space program? Where do we go from here? What does this mean for Apollo? When we return, will beating the Russians provoke the U.S. to move hastily? on Discovery Sunday, next. As a new parent, my hours can be pretty unpredictable. I think a lot of the young parents that come into my office and talk about life insurance have a lot of the same needs and have gone through a lot of the same things that I've gone through. They're really looking for somebody to tell them about life insurance, to talk to somebody they trust. When people leave my office, I think they feel that, hey, this guy doesn't just know about life insurance, he knows about life, too. State Farm is there. You're witnessing a breakthrough in sleep comfort, unlike any inner spring mattress or waterbed. In the next two minutes, you will discover a way to achieve the most sound and restful sleep your body has ever known. If you toss and turn all night, if you and your partner disagree on how firm your mattress should be, or if you simply want a better night's sleep, call now for a free video and brochure. Something wonderful happens when you sleep on select comfort, when you sleep on air all night. What's with you? It's like you're walking on air. No, just sleeping on air. You walk on air all day. What is it about her these days? New hair, new clothes, new mattress. I'm sleeping on air. That's the feeling you get every day. Ready, guys? You two are a breath of fresh air. That's because we sleep on air. With select comfort. Can you imagine sleeping on air? Imagine a cushion of air supporting every curve and contour of your body. You wake up more refreshed and more energized. That's select comfort. Not just a better mattress, but a better way to sleep. Even back pain sufferers can sleep more comfortably. Look, conventional inner springs can produce uncomfortable pressure points and uneven support. Many water beds can cause a bending of your spine. But select comfort's unique air support cradles your entire body for better sleep comfort. Plus, unlike other mattresses, you can adjust just the firmness, extra firm for you or feather soft for your partner with a touch of a button. If you toss and turn all night, if you and your partner disagree on how firm your mattress should be, or if you simply want a better night's sleep, call now for free information. Call 1-800-414-7711 for your free information on Select Comfort. Call now and you'll also get this free video with demonstrations and better sleep success stories from Select Comfort owners. Plus, read about our 20-year limited warranty and no-risk 90-night trial offer. That number again is 1-800-414-7711. Call now, 1-800-414-7711. Sleep better on air.
Next, it was the first of its kind, and it was supposed to win a war. What happened? Off the coast of the Carolinas, modern technology goes in search of the past. Rebel beneath the waves, as Discovery Sunday continues next on the Discovery Channel. Explore. The plane goes down. The ship is sinking. Find out if you have what it takes to survive. Staying alive on Sidetrack. Premiering Monday at 10 Mountain, 9 Pacific on the Discovery Channel. Explore your world. We return to Tragedy on Pad 34, Apollo Explore. 1. The burned out capsule was taken away to be inspected and analyzed. NASA immediately impaneled a team to investigate the fire. One of its high profile members was astronaut Frank Borman. We think what happened there was probably an electrical short down uh, in the uh, lower equipment bay near Gus's, uh, near the command pilot's left foot that uh, created a spark. And of course, we were, we were with 100% oxygen at a uh, PSI of around 21 pounds, so uh, that spark propagated rapidly and uh, became an explosion. And I think that was the most exhaustive investigation to date uh, in either aircraft or space. We did everything, but we could never find the exact cause. And here you had the spacecraft, Everything was there, but uh, it was very difficult to, uh, we, we think we know what happened, but we can't say for sure. The investigating committee released a report that ran 3,300 pages and weighed 19 pounds. It made several recommendations, including designing a new hatch that would open outwardly and quickly. But it did not address the oxygen problem head on. It said that the idea of using a two gas system, nitrogen and oxygen, in future spacecraft would be studied. Congress was told by NASA that it had changed many of its procedures. I would advise the committee that we now have over 20,000 hours of experience in test time with a single gas system, that we have uh, many hours uh, with manned uh, uh, over 3,000 hours with man under these test conditions, over 500 of these hours at sea, under sea level conditions. However, as a result of this experience, we are analyzing again and reviewing again a two gas system, and we are also examining ways of changing the accessibility to the cabin. But that two gas system had already been studied. The contractor for the Apollo Command Module, North American Aviation, it started designing the spacecraft with a two-gas system from the beginning. And this was the reason. North American had built the X-15 rocket plane, and it had experience with fire in cockpits. Its test pilots breathed pure oxygen through their helmets, but their cockpits in the X-15 were filled with pure nitrogen, which douses fire better than water. In this ground test, the X-15 pilot was protected by what engineers called his island of safety, including the nitrogen atmosphere. X-15 test pilot here would walk away from this explosion and fire. Dr. Toby Friedman was North American's flight surgeon. He had argued with NASA to restudy their practice of using 100% oxygen under pressure in their spacecraft before launch. I was naturally concerned about the potential risk of flame up to and including explosivity in the Apollo mission. NASA ended further discussion in 1962 while Apollo was still in the design stage with this memo ordering North American to delete all nitrogen provisions and to provide a cabin atmosphere of pure oxygen. And we came to a standoff from the get-go because I insisted that this trade-off be done and they insisted that 100% oxygen be used. And this was based on their experience operationally with Mercury and Gemini. So they felt fairly confident because of the good experience in those missions. 
NASA had many reasons to go with one gas, as it always had in all of its spacecraft. It was cheaper to build a one gas system. It made for less weight, and it made the engineering much simpler. And by 1967, 16 manned safe flights was ample reassurance of its safety. The public, and even most NASA officials, did not know there was an option. The 100% oxygen question, I only know that Gemini and Mercury, which were certainly open, common, and were in a paper, were discussed and known, and it was 100% oxygen. And I'm not aware there's ever any discussion of doing it any differently on Apollo until after of the fires. NASA had decided it would take greater control of everything after the fire. It appointed a crack group of engineers and administrators to ride herd on future development of the Apollo spacecraft. After the investigation of the fire, I was sent out to North America and, uh, to head up what we call the Tiger Team, which was basically there on site to make certain that the changes that were mandated by the change board in Houston went through, flowed through smoothly in actuality. After the hurried investigations and hearings, NASA and Congress wanted to get on with it. They still had to beat the Russians to the moon. American officials knew from intelligence sources that the Soviets were already into a long pre-launch countdown for the first flight of their moonship. It was called Soyuz. The American public may not have known the whole story, but they wanted to get on with it too. And the American public, although they may not have been aware of the details of what the Russians were doing, you've got to go back to the day that Sputnik flew and how terrified and shocked and humiliated and indeed challenged the American people were is, you know, what are we going to do about it? The entire world looked to this country that says, what are you guys going to do about it over there? What do you, the Russians just put up, the Soviets just put up something in space and it's pretty mysterious and we don't know what it means, but what, are, what is America going to do about it? I think we had the same feeling. We felt the same public opinion feeling after the Apollo 1 fire. As the Americans were wrapping up their quick investigation of Apollo 1, Soyuz 1 was being readied for liftoff from the Soviet Space Center at Baikonur. In early spring of 1967, it seemed that once again, the Soviets were poised to beat the Americans in space. When we return, a Russian cosmonaut falls. The U.S. seizes the edge in the space race on Discovery Sunday, next. This is the hardest thing I've ever done. I mean, these people were like family to me. Remember I met Jeannie at the company picnic? Ah, it was the best thing that ever happened to you. Yeah, taking the new job was a tough decision. Deciding what to do with my 401k money was another. I didn't want to mess it up. I called T-Bro Price, you know, you told me about the mutual funds. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, they sent me a rollover kit, you know. It took me through it step by step. I made it easy for you. Yeah, piece of cake. T-Row Price, helping people invest with confidence for over 50 years. It's gonna be a good job. Yeah. Two hundredths of a second. A human eye begins to blink. A hummingbird flits its wings once and a sensor in a door frame tells an airbag in a seat to deploy. Because when it comes to your safety, every hundredth of a second counts. The 1997 Lexus LS 400. Imagine you're on a journey. glasses that's a big decision but I can make sure you end up happy you look great customers are very comfortable knowing that they have a guarantee at lens crafters hi hi 
really wanted to bring these back. If you end up having second thoughts about your new glasses, you can always come back. No problem. I can replace them or I can refund your money. At Lens Crafters, no hassles. We'll do whatever it takes to make you happy. Oh, they look great. It's not just a guarantee, it's a promise. Lens Crafters, helping people see better, one hour at a time. Tomorrow on Wild Discovery. Wild. Bigger, tougher, faster than any player you've ever seen. In a massive football mascots. As Wild Discovery continues tomorrow at 9 Mountain, 8 Pacific. On the Discovery Channel. Explore. Next, investigate the historic tragedy of Apollo 1. Then explore what might have been the Civil War's largest casualty on Discovery Sunday. Then go behind bars as a young offender on Justice Files. Coming up on the Discovery Channel. We're gonna get some big equipment in here. Al, we have really big equipment in here. We just don't have any operators today. What do you mean? Well, not everybody can operate this equipment. Hey, you guys, where do you want this dirt? Steve, Holly's driving that. Barwick Automotive Group is getting bigger for you. Steve, I thought you said these were hard to operate. <laughs> Al, I don't know, but what I know is that nobody will make you a better deal than Barwick. Hey, what are you doing? And I mean nobody. Remarkably enough, the same engine that's used at the Indy 500 powers the all-new Infiniti Q45 luxury performance sedan. And if the new Q45's engine can compete on the track, imagine what it can do for your commute. Tragedy on Pad 34, Apollo Explore. 1. In April of 1967, while America was still mourning the loss of its three Apollo astronauts, the Russians were rehearsing their first steps to the moon. But fate was about to step in. Veteran cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov was to be a pivotal figure in their moon program. He was a national hero, having been one of the pioneer cosmonauts. He had been ceremoniously decorated in Red Square for his space exploits. Now he was to get the prize assignment. He was to pilot Soyuz 1, built to test lunar procedures in Earth orbit. What Komarov learned on his flight would be used to get a Russian to the moon. April 23, 1967, 86 days after the Apollo 1 fire, Soyuz 1 was launched from Baikonur, the secret Soviet space complex. The Russians did a lot of things differently from the Americans. First, they used a nitrogen-oxygen mix for their atmosphere inside the Soyuz capsules. And instead of batteries for power, like the Americans used, they deployed solar panels once in orbit, relying on energy from the sun to power their craft. That was the Russians' mistake. On Soyuz 1, the panels did not deploy properly. Komarov lost power and tumbled through space. On his re-entry, his Soyuz 1 plunged to the ground, killing him instantly. The first Russian step on the ladder to the moon, like the American one, ended in tragedy. In just three months, the two nations racing each other to the moon had lost four men, and both space programs were stalled. Things were even. Of course, you hate to see anybody get killed, even, a, even an adversary. But, uh, uh, you, you know, be, be honest with you, you're sitting there thinking, well, they're having problems too. Maybe they're not, maybe this will set them back a little bit. I hope so. <laughs> it set them back a lot, and it gave America the chance to forge ahead. We were on a fast track. The president said we're going to get to the moon by the end of the decade. This was, this was 1967. We had three years, 67, 68, 69, to get to the moon. We hadn't even flown an Apollo spaceship yet. We were sort of overcome with constant schedules. We got to get there. The spacecraft was too heavy. Uh, we didn't have enough time. We were, we were pushing, pushing, pushing. The main push was in overhauling the Apollo spacecraft. 
there was a whole slug of changes that were made, not simply to improve the safety, but to improve the vehicle. There, they were, all of these things were waiting out here. And under the umbrella of the fire, they got put into the, what we call the Block II spacecraft, which was an improved version of the one that burned. NASA poured almost half a billion dollars into redesigning the Apollo spacecraft, including a new hatch that could be opened in three seconds. The changes that were made subsequent to the fire were very, very significant. We changed the hatch so that there could be easier uh, emergency egress in the event of another uh, problem like that. We, we changed the environmental control system. We changed the whole interior of the spacecraft with some uh, newly manufactured paint and, uh, and fabrics that would not burn, even in 100% oxygen. It was a, a vastly different and much improved spacecraft. Of all the changes made, probably the most important was in the command module's atmosphere. NASA finally developed a two-gas system of nitrogen and oxygen for the spacecraft, at least for use when it was under pressure on the ground. So you breathe pure oxygen before you launch, you breathe pure oxygen during the launch, and you breathe oxygen, pure oxygen during the flight. We changed that, obviously, after the fire and went to a nitrogen atmosphere of 80%, 20% oxygen. And as we went into orbit, we replenished the leaking gases that leak out very, very slowly, but they do leak out with pure oxygen. So after about, well, maybe 10 hours in orbit, you were back in pure oxygen. But interestingly enough, if I put my fingers like this as a candle flame, notice there's a convection current that causes that to go up to former point. There's no convection or weightlessness, so the flame just sits there randomly and doesn't get gas to support itself, it burns out. Wally Shira, as backup to Gus Grissom on the Apollo 1 flight, was selected to command the first true flight of Apollo, an Earth orbital exercise to test lunar procedures and hardware. His two crewmen, Walt Cunningham and Don Isley, had also been on the backup crew for Apollo 1. Their flight would be designated Apollo 7, the flights between it and Apollo 1 being unmanned. On October 11th, 1968, one year and nine months after the fire on Pad 34, three astronauts were back up there being sealed into an Apollo capsule. Gunther Wendt was in charge of what they called the closeout crew, the men who buttoned up the spacecraft. We had to go through a large number of tests to verify that, yes, we have corrected all the problems we had on Apollo 1. Now, Apollo 7 actually carried a large burden with it because most people involved realized if we have a problem with Apollo 7, that the whole Apollo program may be canceled. Super, Tom. When Apollo 7 was launched, America held its breath. This time, everything worked perfectly. Apollo 7 cruised for a letter-perfect 11-day flight. The ghost of Apollo 1, a NASA official said, was effectively exorcised. But it was the fall of 1968. In 14 months, the 60s would be over. America still had to get to the moon. That's what the three Apollo 1 astronauts had died for. When we return, the Apollo 1 calamity makes a monumental step for mankind a reality on Discovery Sunday next.
But sonic technology is also used to clean something far more valuable. His teeth. Sonic Air, high-speed brushing and sonic waves remove plaque beyond the reach of the bristles. For strong, healthy teeth and gums, Sonic Air. Amazing, isn't it? Thank you for calling the Scudder Funds. This is Warren Anderson. How may I help you? Yeah, hi. I have a year-end bonus, but I want to invest. And I read something about this fund of funds thing that Scudder has. That's right, the Pathway Series. It's comprised of a group of different Scudder funds. So the main benefit... Hello. Sorry about that. I'm calling from the car. Okay. Uh, the benefit is that you can diversify within a range of... The Pathway Series. Instant diversification. Hello. Talk to us before you invest. Call 1-800-SCUTTER. Get ready, mate, to enter Discovery Channel's new view at You Do It Sweepstakes and qualify to win a trip for two to Australia from Qantas Airways, including an adventure expedition in the outback while you're down under. You'll also receive home fitness equipment from the makers of Tylenol and $15,000 from Discover Car. To enter, watch Eco Challenge, the ultimate human endurance competition, beginning Sunday, February 16th at 10 Mountain, 9 Pacific. Explore your world with Discovery Channel. Too bad about that headache, hon. I guess we're staying home. Headache's gone, sweetie. But you were really hurting. Took some Tylenol. Extra strength. All gone. <laughs> no way. <laughs> Just a memory now. Tylenol did that? For headaches, Tylenol is recommended the most by doctors. You are gonna love the ballet. Bring the Tylenol. Tylenol, the pain reliever hospitals use most. Space, no longer an impossible frontier. The Discovery Channel presents the Space Shuttle. This two-hour Discovery special video presentation takes you behind the scenes for the first time as you witness the drama and majesty of the Space Shuttle firsthand from the people who've made it possible. To order the Space Shuttle for only $24.95, call 1-800-417-1616. The Space Shuttle, man's grasp has now equaled his reach. We return to Tragedy on Pad 34, Apollo it's 1. The moon was still the prize. By the end of 1968, with one year to go on Kennedy's self-imposed deadline, the Russians still could beat America to the moon. The Russians at that point in time possessed the capability of orbiting the moon. And I think the feeling was that if they orbit, although we, with, with the problems they had in their big booster for their landing capsule, we figured that if we can look at a timetable that'll get us to the moon by the end of 69, we'll beat them to the surface of the moon. The question was, are they gonna beat us to an orbit around the moon? For propaganda bragging rights, it seems a simple loop of the moon was as good as landing on it. The Russians had redesigned their Soyuz spacecraft for a vehicle they hoped could beat America to at least circle the moon. The next Apollo flight was to be commanded by Frank Borman with Jim Lovell and Bill Anders on his crew. It was to be another Earth orbital flight with more tests. But NASA decided to leapfrog the schedule and scramble Apollo 8 to go not into Earth orbit, but lunar orbit. America was not yet prepared to land on the moon, but it was certainly ready to go there. We were told about it in August and asked what we thought about it. Uh, and there was great, great hope to get it done before the end of the year because the CIA had picked up the information that the Soviets were going to try to circumnavigate the moon before the end of the year in one of their spacecraft. And it turns out, subsequent to the end of the Cold War, that's exactly what they were trying to do. Apollo 8 became the first humans to visit another world, the first to see the backside of the moon. And on Christmas Eve, 1968, Frank Borman moved the planet Earth by reading from the book of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. 
created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. After reading from Genesis, he wished the earth a Merry Christmas from 240,000 miles away, circling an alien world. We could have done it before Borman and Lovell, before them, even by six months. Alexei Leonov, the cosmonaut who had been scheduled to beat Apollo 8 to the moon, says he could have done it. But Soviet space officials would not make the gamble like the Americans did. Seven months after Apollo 8, in July 1969, the flight designated Apollo 11 was launched to the moon with Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins aboard. Three feet, two and a half down, straight shadow, four forward, four forward, drift into the right a little. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Rocket Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. Time to step off the land now. On July 20th, 1969, only eight years after President Kennedy had promised that America would put a man on the moon, Neil Armstrong stepped from Apollo 11's lunar lander to put the first human footprints on a different world. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. There was a unique point in history where everything came together, the support of the people, under the emphasis of the Cold War competition, that allowed us to contribute uh, not only to the winning of the Cold War, but to the basic knowledge of, of, of mankind. Neil took that first step. He took the first step off the shoulders of the Apollo 1 crew as we all did. Apollo 1 was a major significant contribution and sadly enough maybe because of the course of events a greater contribution to the entire Apollo program than had it flown and been a success. Hippity hoppity, hippity hoppity, hippity hopping over hill and dale. Gene Cernan, commander of Apollo 17, was the last man to leave footprints on that alien world. I've always felt, and I've always said, and I believe it today, had we not lost the Apollo 1 crew, we probably would have lost somebody somewhere else on the way to the moon. Had the Apollo 1 tragedy not occurred, I might not have been making those steps on the moon on Apollo 17. And the Apollo 1 tragedy inspired a silent oath. Let's never let this happen again. Let's take all the mistakes we've learned from the Apollo 1 fire and, and, and put them into a spacecraft that is safe and sound and capable of getting the job done. And history will bear out that that's exactly what we did. back to pad 34 today you will see a desolate reminder of the Apollo 1 sacrifice abandoned in place is stenciled on what's left of it government lingo for do not move it or restore it leave it right here as it is if you go at the right time on the right days you can walk under the booster pedestal and look up through the blast pit where Apollo 1 sat and you'll see a foreign world drift directly through the opening, the moon. It comes by regularly, as if looking for those first three Apollo astronauts who never made it. Coming up, 
As Discovery Sunday continues, a technological wonder and the first of its kind, it was supposed to save the South. It was supposed to win a war. But how did this secret weapon become an underwater coffin, more deadly to its crew than the enemy? And why was it missing in action? Off the coast of the Carolinas, go in search of the SS Hunley. Rebel Beneath the Waves is next as Discovery Sunday continues on the Discovery Channel.